Holding into Toulon, the French hospital ship La Marseillaise returns to France 140 soldiers wounded during the recent Anglo-French action in the vicinity of the Suez Canal. Casualties of a surprise invasion that was made without the knowledge of the United States. Two hundred and forty civilians were also evacuated by the hospital ship. Foreigners banished by the Egyptians in reprisal for the Anglo-French attack. They will be sent to their respective consulates as soon as possible. Shocked by the recent easy defeats of the regular Egyptian army and its loss of nearly all the weapons supplied it by the Kremlin, the citizens of Cairo formed a liberation army a force of civilians which staged this resistance parade to attract recruits. Many women volunteered, but they won't be needed. The invading Anglo-French Israeli forces obeying the United Nations are withdrawing from the ancient land. Egypt wasn't off the critical list a day when Syria, another of the world's most ancient lands, became a trouble spot. For the case of jitters that set it training a great number of so-called volunteers to handle the arms, it too was supplied by the Kremlin. Without rhyme or reason, Damascus, encouraged by Soviet propaganda, says it is going to be attacked by the West. And it doesn't want to suffer the fate of Egypt and lose all its new arms to ignorance in handling them. Worthy members of the United Nations, Israeli troops leave the Sinai Desert as directed by Secretary General Hamashow. True, they've rid the region of the sneak raiders on Israel who made it their home. But the action shows the Republic to be aware of its international obligations and its desire for peace. But at Haifa, the arrival of new hundreds of Jewish refugees must make Israel wonder if its peaceful overtures are not misunderstood. For these Jews, after all their worldly possessions had been confiscated, have been driven out of Egypt. Victims of the petty spirit of revenge, they add to the roles of the world's homeless due to communist troublemaking. In comparative peace after many troubled months, Nicosia on the island of Cyprus feels the gasoline shortage caused by the Suez Canal crisis. Official business gets him a half pint, though even this is better than sanguinary guerrilla warfare. The first NATO Council meeting since the breach between the Allies over the Suez brings Secretary of State Dulles to Paris to try to end the discord caused by the Anglo-French action in Egypt. Selwyn Lloyd, British Foreign Minister and French Foreign Minister Christian Pinot are in a conciliatory mood for the meeting, which becomes a forum for interpreting the foreign policies of all member nations. Descending from the plane that flew him home to England across the Atlantic, Prime Minister Sir Anthony Eden looks tanned and fit as he returns to London from his three weeks holiday in Jamaica. He's confident, too, that time will justify his policy on the Suez Canal. The formation of a United Nations force could be the turning point in the history of the United Nations. I am convinced more convinced than I've been about anything in all my public life that we were right, my colleagues and I, in the judgment and the decision we took, and that history will prove it so. Before returning to England in compliance with the United Nations request, British soldiers stage a house-to-house -house search in Port Said for an officer kidnapped by Egyptian fanatics. Every building of the Suez Canal City is systematically explored for the missing man, a 20-year-old officer of the West Yorkshire Regiment. A car used by the abductors was found covered with bloodstains as the British round up and question all Egyptian males over 15. 
some of whom were held. With United Nations troops now in control of the area, the last of the invading British troops leave the Suez Canal city of Port Said. A withdrawal that is followed quickly by the return of Egyptian forces to the delight of the citizens. An effigy of a British Tommy is hung as a mob of Egyptians go on to demolish a statue of Delesseps. A sickening, stupid mob gesture, for he was the brilliant Frenchman whose courage and foresight built the Suez Canal. Nationalism is rampant during the demonstration, and the raising of an Egyptian flag is a signal for general rejoicing. At the western end of the Suez Canal, the Danish salvage ship Protector puts over the first divers who will actually start working on submerged ships that are blocking the waterway. Under the direction of United Nations experts, the Danes, with divers from several other nations, will begin by clearing away major obstructions first. Later, they'll go to work on removing smaller hulks and wreckage from the canal's edges. A signal for hope that it will not be long before a passage is cleared for at least small boats. At Port Said, the last batch of Egyptian prisoners of war, captured during the Anglo-French invasion of the Suez Canal Zone, are being repatriated. These particular men were fortunate in falling into the hands of the considerate British Tommies. And now, all cleaned up and well-fed, they go back to Cairo, none the worse physically for their experience. Of course, they're a little chagrined at the ease with which they were captured. It's life as usual in the Gaza Strip, and the prophets of old could return here and mark little change. The momentary excitement caused by Israel's cleanup of raiding Fedayeens in the Sinai Desert is over, and Jeremiah or Mohammed could feel at home in these marketplaces. A United Nations truck lends a note of modernity to the scene, which shows the Western world conforming to a Christian principle. An enterprise of care, the package purveyors, which sees to it that the children of the Arab refugees living in the Strip are fed. Striking his colors not in defeat, but to attest national responsibility, Israel's General Moshe Dayan withdraws his army from the Sinai Peninsula. An action at El Arish made in deference to United Nations directives. But it is over at Rafa in Israel that the little Mideast Republic proves itself not only responsible, but generous. As under United Nations supervision, it returns 5,000 Egyptian prisoners of war for four Israeli soldiers who were captured during the Sinai invasion. The exchange was organized by the Red Cross and it's carried out by Yugoslavian United Nations police forces using Yugoslav mobile units. A joint Red Cross United Nations triumph. Crisis in the Middle East over Israel's last-minute delay in withdrawing its forces from disputed areas brings U.S. Ambassador Lawson to see Premier David Ben-Gurion at Tel Aviv. It's a visit of reassurance to help the Premier with his own cabinet, which opposes him on his withdrawal policy. The meeting has the desired results, and at an Israeli post in the Gaza Strip, the Republic's troops still held there hear the flash that they too will be pulled out which joins General Dayan and General Burns at Lida Airport to complete plans for the latter's UN emergency force to occupy the Strip and the Gulf of Aqaba area. Protesting giving up the Gaza Strip and the Aqaba area, the populace of Jerusalem gives the police a hard time. But Premier Ben-Gurion's policy to heed the United Nations' appeal to Israel prevails. The decision causing the evacuation of Sharm el-Sheikh, commanding the entrance to the Gulf of Aqaba, with the Republic's troops being returned to Eilat at the head of the Gulf. 
Biblical Gaza, too, is affected, and Canada's General Burns, heading a UN emergency force, confers with Colonel Lindquist, commander of a Danish unit that is taking over this section from the Israeli, aided by a crack Canadian contingent. General Moshe Dayan, who led the lightning strike against the Egyptians, directed the evacuations in both areas, movements that continued without cessation, round the clock. But communist provocateurs have been active in the city of Gaza, and spurred by these hate mongers, the natives shout obscenities at the UN force and later stone the men. Meanwhile in Washington, President Eisenhower signs the bill that makes his Mideast doctrine effective. He describes it as an expression by Congress and the administration of a determination to help Middle East countries preserve their independence, a pledge in the interest of world freedom.